Haru paces anxiously back and forth across the room. He believes that a bride is a terrible idea. He doesn't know exactly who they'll bring to him, but he's certain it will be a true rabbit. He fears it will be odd if, in time, they can't have children. And what will happen if his true nature is revealed? Suddenly, a girl enters and says she's returned. The boy quickly transforms into a rabbit. The girl looks at her pet and remarks that he has lost a lot of weight. She touches his face with her finger and says this won't do, and that he needs to be patient a little longer. She gazes at him intently, lost in thought. The girl picks up a red ribbon. She ties a bow around his neck, exclaiming that he's such a handsome little fellow, like a young master. Now you can meet your bride, she says. Suddenly, she reveals a large gift wrapped in red paper. She explains that she was in such a rush to introduce them that she had to skip her water break. She unwraps the gift and apologizes for the wait. Beneath the wrapping is a cage containing a white rabbit. Haru realizes this is his bride. She exclaims that the bride is beautiful and asks Haru what he thinks. She sets the cage with the rabbit on the table, and Haru rushes towards it. The girl asks what they should name her. She says if it's his wife, her name should start with Ha. She notes that the rabbit's fur is pure white. What about Snow White? She asks. The rabbit makes it clear with a sharp gaze that she disapproves of how Haru is looking at her. His highness is advised to pretend to be a female. He asks the boy if this is the entire plan and whether he's mocking him. The boy implores his highness to at least listen. He explains that the master of the house is currently seeking a female, and knowing this, they've already made contact. All his highness needs to do is behave docilely. The boy asks if he thinks this is even possible. Two of his highness's aides glance at each other unsure of what to say. They insist on it and hand him a pill to transform him into a rabbit. Now his highness is a white rabbit and he climbs into the cage. This is the very rabbit that ended up in Haru's master's hands. Now in his rabbit form, his highness thinks these people are simply scoundrels. He considers himself fortunate that this person is so naive, wondering what would have happened if they'd been caught. Meanwhile, Haru gazes in awe at his bride. The white rabbit asks if he really can't tell the difference between a female and a male, and why would he think she's his wife? Yet Haru continues to look at her as if she were his bride. Snow White wonders where this immature fool came from. She thinks she doesn't have time to waste on idiots like him. The white rabbit thinks they're all the same. Whether in human or rabbit form, they all fear him. He starts scanning the room, searching for the moon rabbit, wondering if it might be hiding. Haru suddenly asks him what he's looking for. He asks if she's hungry, but Snow White responds by calling him a freak. She demands how he dares to call her his bride. The mistress offers Haru some of his favorite blueberries and he eagerly runs to her. The white rabbit thinks he's found a fool who can't even tell a female from a male. And fortunately, he himself is male and could never be the moon rabbit. Outwardly small and foolish with a body that looks like a round ball, this strikes him as utterly absurd. Meanwhile, the mistress admires how he looks. The white rabbit tells himself he didn't see any of this. Suddenly, he notices the blueberries placed in his cage. The mistress pats Haru on the head and asks if he's decided to yield to Snow White and if he really likes his bride. She wonders aloud if he's accepted his bride and says she's starting to get jealous. The white rabbit thinks this is nothing but a duet of fools. He muses that if he eats the blueberries, he'll end up fathering three children. As the mistress feeds Haru more berries, the white rabbit decides to see whether he'll break or not. He watches as Haru enjoys his blueberries with great pleasure. In truth, the white rabbit is extremely hungry. But if he eats those berries, he'll acknowledge himself as the bride. Moreover, he knows if he eats, he'll fall asleep immediately, and then he won't be able to escape and search for the moon rabbit. He picks up a berry and thinks that if he eats just a little, nothing bad will happen. He takes a bite, and the blueberry tastes incredibly sweet to him. The mistress and Haru watch with delight as the new rabbit eats. After eating his fill of blueberries, Snow White collapses in contentment. Night falls, Haru turns back into a human and entering the mistress's room sees that she's already asleep. He approaches the rabbit's cage and lovingly embraces his bride. He vows that he will surely make her happy. Morning came. The mistress was running terribly late. Haru felt as if a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. He barely managed to wake her again and had returned to his human form. The white rabbit asked if it was this noisy every morning. Haru, delighted that his wife was awake, was once again met with the rabbit's protest that he was not his wife. 
The rabbit demanded the boy immediately release him from the cage. Haru apologized, admitting that the cage must be uncomfortable and that as a man, he should have taken better care of him. He opened the cage. He apologized again, saying that this was his first time having a wife. He remarked that his wife was so soft with button-like eyes and her little nose and mouth were adorable. The warmth of his wife radiated through his palm. He felt something strange. Suddenly, the rabbit asked where the other animal had gone. He said that aside from him, there was supposed to be a graceful and noble Mayo in here. Haru seemed confused, not understanding what he was talking about. The rabbit began to lash out, insulting Haru with various names, explaining that he was talking about the female Mayoin. Haru said there was no such creature. Since he had been living here, there had been no other Mayoin except for his wife. The rabbit accused him of lying, but Haru insisted he wasn't, asking why he would lie about such a thing. But the rabbit had been told that the sacred moon rabbit was definitely here. Haru asked what he was talking about, but the rabbit refused to discuss it further. Haru reassured him that it was true. He had never seen another Mayoin, and he had always been alone. The rabbit could see by his expression that Haru wasn't lying. The rabbit wondered, could it be that the moon rabbit wasn't here after all? Could the royal palace have made such a grave mistake? Haru tried to comfort him, saying everything was fine now because he was here. He gently stroked the rabbit, saying that neither Haru nor his wife were alone anymore. The rabbit asked how that made anything better and stated it didn't concern him whether Haru was alone or not. He jumped off the table. Haru tried to catch him, but the rabbit was already outside. If the moon rabbit wasn't here, he had no reason to stay. He needed to return as quickly as possible. But suddenly Haru appeared beside him, asking what he was doing. The rabbit found that he couldn't transform back into a human. Haru said he understood what his wife was trying to do. He figured she wanted to eat some mugwort and assured her she could rely on him. The boy put on a hat and started picking the herb, asking if his wife had ever lived in a human household before. The rabbit replied that she hadn't and asked why it mattered. Haru explained that living in a house wasn't always easy, but it could also be fun. He promised that his wife would get used to the new circumstances. Once again, he vowed to make his wife happy. The rabbit sat under the hat and begged him to stop calling him his wife. He introduced himself as Ninso. Haru responded by introducing himself as Haru. Ninso reminded him that he already knew that. Suddenly, the rabbit asked why Haru had picked so much mugwort. The boy answered that he thought his wife wanted to eat it, which is why he had done so. Although the rabbit didn't recall ever saying that, Haru claimed that this time of year it tasted the best and that he'd prepare a treat for her. Ninso retorted that mugwort is the same everywhere, even in Africa. Haru insisted that wasn't the case at all. Suddenly, a small stone fell near Ninso. Looking around, he noticed that other rabbits were calling him. Ninso approached them. He told his subordinates that the Mayoan living here wasn't the moon rabbit. One of the rabbits asked his highness if he had personally verified it. Ninso confirmed that it was indeed not her. He explained that only a male lived here and that they had wasted their efforts for nothing. One of the rabbits remarked that the moon rabbit is responsible for fertility and longevity, and that gender didn't matter. Ninso questioned whether it wasn't a female who was responsible for fertility. One rabbit asked his highness what kind of clover he had eaten, reminding him that they both must endure the pains of childbirth and raising children. Ninso inquired if a male, who could neither conceive nor give birth, could truly be responsible for fertility. They informed him that the moon rabbit could bear children regardless of gender. His subordinates asked if his highness had checked for the moon rabbit's distinguishing features. Ninso had never heard of such a thing. The martial arts master and storyteller asked his highness what he had been doing during their lessons. They added that it was fortunate he had learned about this, even if it was now. His subordinates asked him to listen carefully. The moon rabbit bears nine spots resembling the Big Dipper, and deep within its body lies a bone made of red corundum. Ninso asked if all he had to do was confirm these two points. The rabbits affirmed this, asking if he also knew the secret of the bone's power. Ninso wondered aloud who they thought they were ignoring, admitting he didn't know, and demanded they tell him quickly. They explained that it was a dual erogenous zone. Ninso was about to ask how he could verify such a thing, but the rabbit suggested he take something. They handed him a small pill, and his highness asked what it was. They explained that it was meant to counteract the effects of the previous pill, which had turned him into a rabbit. Since he was still in this form, the previous pill had been too potent. 
this pill would neutralize its effect. Ninso expressed his relief as he had been worried about not being able to return to human form and swallowed the pill, but his appearance didn't change. They explained that their bodies weren't machines and the effect wouldn't happen instantly. Furthermore, he was different from ordinary Myoan. Ninso became irritated and asked what would happen if he suddenly transformed back into a human. He wondered if they had fed him a slow-acting bomb. The rabbits fled, and Ninso called after them, demanding to know who would listen to him. Suddenly, Haru approached him and asked if his wife had been planning to escape. Haru carried the rabbit to the bath. Ninso explained that he had no intention of running away. Haru then asked why he had gone outside in that case. Ninso explained it was to chase away some suspicious individuals. Haru asked if, perhaps, he had met some street cats and made friends with them. Ninso begged him to stop joking around and to remove what he called the terrifying contraption, the shower. Haru continued spraying him with water. He insisted he wasn't angry, but Ninso accused him of lying and asked why he was dousing him with water if that was the case. Haru replied that he had simply noticed some dirt in the rabbit's fur and that he smelled bad. He explained that if the dirt dried, it would be hard to clean, but if Ninso was so afraid of water, he could transform into a human. He didn't mind. However, Ninso was already under the water and wasn't opposed to it after all. He was opposed from the very beginning, and in any case, he couldn't transform at will. It was worth becoming a rabbit just to endure such a horror. Haru soaped his hands and began scrubbing Ninso. The rabbit had almost resigned himself to the washing, but Haru was far too vigorous. Ninso didn't like the way he was being washed, and Haru asked if he should be gentler. The force of the shower was making Ninso's head spin. Haru asked if he had been that frightened and reassured him promising to rinse everything off quickly. Suddenly, Haru saw something unexpected. Instead of a rabbit, a man was now sitting in his bath. Ninso had unexpectedly transformed back into a human and demanded to know why Haru was staring at him like that. Haru was utterly astonished by what he saw. His wife had transformed into a man. He touched Ninso's body and remarked how soft he was. Ninso, confused, asked what Haru was doing, realizing that the pill had finally taken effect. He felt uncomfortable. He didn't like how much Haru was fawning over him, so he shoved Haru out the door. Calling him a scoundrel, Haru had imagined his wife would be just as petite in human form as in her rabbit form. He was shocked by what he had just witnessed, yet he couldn't help but think that this person was incredibly handsome. He also wanted to appear cool in front of his wife. An idea popped into his head. Meanwhile, Ninso realized he wanted to go home. He recalled how Haru had stared at him, but more importantly, Ninso started to feel that somehow he was beginning to like Haru. He thought that if things had come to this, he would use any means necessary to escape, just as Haru called out to him. Ninso had left his towel beside the basket, along with his spare clothes. He decided he would endure a little longer, and soon, all this business with moon rabbits would be over. Haru asked if his wife was hungry. He asked Ninso to wait while he wiped the floor. Ninso thought Haru was just a fool. Suddenly, he asked what that smell was. Haru showed him a pot and said he had prepared a dish just for him. It smelled delicious. Haru asked if it smelled good to him and said it was rice cakes with mugwort. Ninso remarked that these rice cakes didn't look like the ones he'd had before. But then again, he thought, they were made by this fool. He admitted that they were tasty and that Haru wasn't so bad at this. Haru said he enjoyed cooking. Every season, the yard was full of various things like apricots and persimmons. Ninso agreed that apricots and persimmons were delicious. Haru added that while they didn't have them in the garden, in autumn it was great to roast ginkgo nuts. Ninso asked how anyone could roast such a stinky thing. Haru confidently replied that roasted, they were very tasty. Ninso said that if Haru claimed so, it must be true. Haru took his hand and asked if he'd like to roast ginkgo with him in autumn. He said that in winter they could bake sweet potatoes and chestnuts. He could peel them all himself and feed him. He could even peel mandarins for him. Haru admitted that he had been surprised when he suddenly ended up living here, but he promised to be the perfect husband. He asked if Ninso would officially become part of his family. Ninso couldn't understand why Haru still considered him a woman, while Haru simply pleaded for him to accept his proposal. Haru desperately wanted to be with Ninso for a long and happy life together. Suddenly, Ninso leaned his lips toward Haru's and asked him to open his mouth. Haru closed his eyes in bliss 
thinking that even his wife's confession was incredibly cool. Suddenly, Ninso shoved two fingers into Haru's mouth. Ninso was about to check inside Haru's mouth. Suddenly, he withdrew his hands in horror. Haru asked what he was doing and complained that he nearly bit Ninso's fingers off. Haru added that Ninso had almost torn his mouth open. Ninso told him to stop talking and to open his mouth wider, making sure the back teeth were visible. Haru asked what he was trying to find. He wondered if the moon rabbit Ninso was looking for had something peculiar in its mouth. Ninso thought Haru was an idiot, but Haru had guessed correctly. Ninso hastily denied it, claiming that wasn't the case at all. Haru remarked that his wife was terrible at lying. Ninso wondered how such a fool could understand things so well. He asked what difference it made since Haru wasn't the moon rabbit. Haru suggested that it could have been him. Ninso flatly rejected the idea, explaining that the moon rabbit was a sacred and noble creature. So how could someone like Haru possibly be it? Haru asked what he needed to do to become the moon rabbit. If Ninso was looking for one, he could become it himself. Ninso scoffed, saying Haru's foolishness knew no bounds. One couldn't simply become the moon rabbit by trying hard. He explained that the moon rabbit was born, not made. It was a sacred animal chosen by the heavens. He told Haru that he would never become one. Haru asked why that mattered and said it was all nonsense anyway. He dismissed the whole idea of the moon rabbit as nothing more than ridiculous tales. If one could become the moon rabbit simply by being born, then it was a trivial matter. Ninso protested that it was far from trivial. The moon rabbit was born once every hundred years and was responsible for fertility and prosperity, no less. Haru remarked that he wondered if the moon rabbit even wanted to be born that way. He asked if the moon rabbit was truly happy living a life dictated by fate. Ninso didn't understand what he was talking about. Was the moon rabbit truly content with the destiny set for it from birth? Did it have any say in what it liked or disliked? Ninso carried human blood and couldn't even fully transform into a rabbit. This had caused him many problems since childhood. He had been blamed and shamed for it. Ninso thought that nobility had always been that way. What mattered most was who you were from the very beginning. Ninso told Haru to stop talking and to open his mouth quickly. Haru asked why he was so determined to find the moon rabbit. Did he want to marry the moon rabbit, start a family and live happily ever after? Haru asked if it absolutely had to be the moon rabbit. Why couldn't it be him? He said that even though he wasn't the moon rabbit, he could still make Ninso happy, and they could have many children together. Ninso told him to shut up and let him ask just one question. He pointed his finger at Haru and asked if Haru hadn't seen him in the bath. Ninso reminded him that he was a man in case Haru hadn't noticed yet. Haru replied that he thought Ninso was very handsome. Ninso retorted that Haru had no shame or decency. Haru shrugged and said it didn't matter, adding that he had known from the beginning that Ninso was male. Ninso pointed out that they were both men, asking how Haru could still think of him as his wife and whether he had missed all his sex education lessons. Haru simply replied, A wife is a wife. Ninso couldn't fathom how anyone could be so ignorant. Haru asked what would happen if he really wasn't the moon rabbit. He grabbed Ninso's hand and asked what he would do then. Ninso said that in that case, of course, he would leave. Suddenly, Haru announced that in that case, he wouldn't show him anything for free. He said he'd reveal it if Ninso could catch him in 20 minutes. And with that, he started running. Ninso thought Haru enjoyed teasing him. He vowed to catch him and give him a good beating. Ninso asked if Haru really thought he couldn't catch someone like him. He almost grabbed Haru, but the boy slipped away. Even though Ninso didn't like it, Haru was clearly having fun. They ran outside. 20 minutes passed. Ninso asked why Haru was so fast and where he got all that stamina. Haru mentioned that the time was up and asked if Ninso needed another five minutes. Ninso thought to himself that whether he was a moon rabbit or a night rabbit, why did everything have to be so difficult? Haru approached Ninso and asked if they were done running. Ninso said that running was for kids and that he would have definitely beaten him up if he had caught him. Haru asked if he had decided to take a nap instead. Ninso admitted he was tired. Haru patted him on the head and told him to get a good rest, and that when he woke up, he would have to leave. Ninso went to the king. He reported that he hadn't found the moon rabbit where he had been searching. The king asked if he was certain. Ninso affirmed his certainty and questioned why he would deceive them. The king said that at the very least, he should have rescued the poor Myoan who had been captured by humans, but Ninso disagreed. He explained that the boy was just a fraud, pretending to be a pet rabbit for a comfortable life. 
The king expressed concern, asking if Ninso was truly sure about everything. Ninso insisted that he was. Suddenly the king was informed that a moon rabbit had arrived to pay respects to his highness. Ninso was astonished by the news. He wondered if Ningjon had brought the rabbit. He regretted being born on the same day as him. Ningjon constantly belittled Ninso. Suddenly, Haru appeared in the room. He remarked that Ninso truly wouldn't lift a finger unless he had to, always drifting with the current. He added that Ninso was simply pitiful. Ninso abruptly woke up, realizing that it had all been a dream. In the kitchen, he saw Haru. Ninso recalled how Haru had asked him to leave because he didn't want to cause himself pain. He wondered if that had also been part of the dream. Haru asked if he had woken up. He said that was great and suggested they have dinner. Ninso pondered what to do if it wasn't just a dream. He thought maybe he should just say goodbye and leave, but he hadn't finished verifying everything. Could he really just walk away so easily? Haru served him a dish, and Ninso asked what it was. Haru replied that it was fried mugwort made from what was left. Ninso began eating, thinking it had all just been a silly dream. Suddenly he realized that the dish was delicious. Haru agreed, saying he also loved fried mugwort. Haru added that there was plenty of rice left, and Ninso could ask for seconds. He urged Ninso to take his time and eat slowly, warning him not to scratch his mouth. Haru encouraged him to eat properly, saying that if he'd known, he would have fed him breakfast too. Ninso remembered the dream. He thought it might be wise to check everything one last time before leaving. Haru mentioned he would wrap up the remaining rice cakes for him. He didn't want Ninso to go hungry on his way home. Suddenly, Ninso frowned. Haru asked what was wrong and if he had bitten his tongue. Ninso wondered if he had misheard something. He realized it hadn't been a dream. The meal and Haru's care were part of a farewell gesture. Haru asked if he was okay. Ninso noticed that Haru had begun addressing him by name. Suddenly, Haru started patting Ninso on the back. Ninso asked what he was doing. Haru said that he finally spoke, as he'd been silent for so long that Haru thought he might have bitten his tongue off. Ninso retorted that it wasn't as simple as that. Haru asked why he'd looked as if he were on the verge of death, insisting that he show his tongue. Ninso refused. Haru leaned closer, saying that if there was an injury, he needed to apply medicine to it. Haru asked him to open his mouth wider, while Ninso pleaded for him to get off of him. Suddenly, Haru's lips moved closer to Ninso's. But then there was a knock on the door. Ninso asked what was happening. Haru quickly began cleaning up, saying that it was Habibi and that he would clear the table himself while Ninso should hurry and turn into a rabbit. Haru found it odd, saying that she was earlier than usual. Her workday wasn't even over yet. Haru swiftly tidied up. Then he asked why Ninso was delaying his transformation. Ninso admitted that he couldn't transform. Panic started to set in. Haru reminded him that he had been a rabbit just the day before. Ninso explained that it was because he had swallowed a special pill that turned him into a rabbit, but even that hadn't worked properly. He had to take another one to turn back into a human. He lamented that those scoundrels should have thought to give him a spare pill. Suddenly, Haru asked him to wait. He peeked outside and saw the mistress, drunk, struggling to unlock the door. He realized that they had a bit of a reprieve. Haru told Ninso not to panic, reassuring him that they'd figure it out before Habibi returned. He asked if Ninso could no longer transform into a rabbit at all. Ninso replied that sometimes he could. He added that even he didn't fully understand it. It seemed to happen when he was extremely surprised or deeply asleep. At that moment, an idea struck Haru. Ninso asked if they shouldn't be hiding, as the woman was about to break the door down. Suddenly, Haru kissed Ninso firmly on the lips. Haru hoped that by surprising Ninso with a kiss, he might transform back into a rabbit. Ninso asked whose lips he had dared to touch. Haru replied that surprises like this could even cure hiccups. Ninso demanded to know what kind of lunatic would do such a thing. Haru explained that in dramas, people do this all the time. Ninso asked what dramas were. Suddenly, they realized the mistress was already inside the apartment. Haru immediately transformed into a rabbit. The mistress cheerfully asked if he had a good time. She announced that she had bought raspberries but drunkenly collapsed and fell asleep. Haru sighed, saying it had been a long day, but welcomed the mistress back and praised her hard work. Ninso approached and asked if she had died. Haru shifted back into his human form, explaining that she wasn't dead, just drunk, and called her pathetic. He mentioned that Habibi had a fondness for alcohol. Haru turned his attention to Ninso, who was unwrapping the mistress's package. 
Haru picked the woman up and asked Ninso if he was strong. Ninso asked if Haru intended to drop her on him. He refused, asking why he should carry someone who reeked of alcohol. Haru dismissed the thought of raspberries for now, saying only parasites eat for free. Ninso reluctantly agreed to carry her. Casting one last glance at the raspberries, the mistress was now in bed. Outside on the porch, Ninso and Haru ate the raspberries. Ninso asked if this was something Haru did every time, removing her makeup, washing her feet, and giving her a massage. It was impressive she didn't wake up through all of that. Haru explained that the food on their table was thanks to Habibi, so it was the least he could do. Though real pet rabbits didn't usually do such things, Haru liked Habibi, and for him, it was a small price to pay. For him, the most important thing was that she was content and happy. Ninso remembered how Haru had wanted to make him happy as his wife. He commented that Haru was like a philanthropist and that anyone could do to make him happy. Suddenly, Haru declared that he liked only Habibi and Ninso. Haru admitted that though Habibi and Ninso were different, he still liked him. Ninso told him to stop and said he hadn't meant to hear that. Haru insisted that it was the truth and that he liked everything about Ninso. Ninso told him he was a fool for saying such things, considering they barely knew each other. Haru asked if it was wrong to have feelings for someone you didn't know well. He wondered if waiting a few days would make it okay to confess. Suddenly, Ninso asked why Haru liked him. Haru replied that Ninso was cute. Ninso questioned if that was true even with his crooked eyes, since everyone told him they were awful. Haru countered that his eyes were beautiful, and his tall stature and broad shoulders were impressive as well. Ninso asked if Haru still thought so, even though he was a half-blood who couldn't transform into a rabbit. Haru confirmed that it didn't matter, asking why it should. He added that if Ninso needed help, he would just assist him again. Ninso teased that Haru's mouth was still small. Haru protested that it wasn't, but Ninso insisted that it was. Ninso reminded him that when he'd put his fingers in Haru's mouth, two big fingers had been enough to fill it entirely. Haru argued that his mouth was wide. Ninso dismissed this, reminding Haru that he had complained about his mouth being torn earlier. He added that Haru couldn't even eat a whole raspberry at once. Haru claimed it was just a rabbit habit. Ninso remarked that if he ate like that, he could forget about being a dignified head of a family. At those words, Haru dropped the raspberries he was holding. Determined to prove his point, Haru declared that his mouth was big and grabbed a handful of raspberries. He stuffed the berries into his mouth, showing how large it was. Suddenly, Haru began to choke, and Ninso asked if he was all right. Ninso patted him on the back, repeating that his mouth really was small. Tears started to stream from Haru's eyes. Ninso looked at him with a mixture of pity and regret. Suddenly, Ninso kissed Haru. With passion, he pushed Haru down onto the floor. Haru's pulse raced, his heartbeat echoing through his entire body. Haru gazed at Ninso with love in his eyes. His mind was enveloped in a fog. Ninso gently runs his fingers through Haru's hair. Then he closes Haru's eyes. He softly asks him not to look at him with that gaze and not to call him by his name. Haru, touching Ninso's cheek, speaks to him again. He says that the name suits him perfectly. They kiss passionately once more, pressing even closer together. Ninso holds Haru tightly against him. Haru, unable to handle the tension, finds everything ending far too quickly. Embarrassed, he explains that it's his first time. Ninso realizes that the woman had been searching for a doe rabbit because Haru was maturing. Haru's heat is the most effective way to deal with it, and that means intimacy. Perhaps Ninso can help with that. He doesn't want to jump into it right away, but he decides to take advantage of the moment to confirm what he needs to confirm. He continues to hold on to Haru. Haru enjoys kissing Ninso. He's happy that they met, and he wants Ninso to become his wife. Mayoan cannot resist the pleasure. Just a taste of it is enough to overwhelm them. Haru tries to stop him, but it's already too late. Ninso regretted the overwhelming passion that had taken over him. Haru approached him. He asked what was wrong and if something was bothering him. Haru thought some gentle words of reassurance would quickly ease the tension. Ninso, deciding that if things had come this far, he might as well check Haru's mouth and then leave, turned to Haru. He asked if Haru had enjoyed their moment of passion. Haru eagerly replied, Yes. Despite his reaction suggesting otherwise, Haru insisted that it had been interesting. In return, Ninso asked for a favor. He requested to take a look at Haru's mouth. Ninso thought that this boy was incredibly foolish, yet so genuine. 
He added that once Haru desired something, he wouldn't be able to resist the pleasure.